Good Sunday. Today's uh, sermon topic is a little bit unusual. We are breaking away from the expository preaching because this is another anniversary. I know we just preached the anniversary message of the whole church, the mother church, uh, just last month. But today is the anniversary of this church, the, this worship service, the third anniversary of RECS. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, we were formed on October the 4th, 2009, uh, so much so that I put in the word of order of worship the date as the 4th of October, but uh, Chrissy called it and she changed it to the 7th of October. Uh, it was a most interesting time to come together and our church was, congregation was formed because our senior pastor, Pastor Stephen Tong, uh, invited me to prayerfully consider whether we should have an English service. Uh, one of the reasons cited back then was that there were many people in the Bahasa church who could not understand Bahasa anymore, uh, the kids from the second generation. And at the same time, people were reaching out to their friends in NUS, NTU and all that, and those were English-speaking people. And so those were some of the ideas that uh, the early leadership uh, did bring up. And so after prayerfully considered uh, this for a while, I I believe that God has called me to lead this uh, congregation. And so I left my post in the Presbyterian Church in Singapore as a ruling elder there and sort of fade away uh, over a period of time. And then finally uh, started the congregation. And to start the congregation, I followed uh, Dr. Tong's couple of key instructions given by him, uh, one of which would be that we have to pray a lot uh, about the church. There must be joy in ministry, if not something is terribly wrong. And also, for the group of people that will come together, we will rely on God to bring them together, as opposed to rely on our organization. In other words, he told me not to set up a leadership structure first, but invite different people that God has called to come together. So it's a little bit uh, unusual or a little bit abstract in, in, in a way that we would sense the guiding of the Holy Spirit and with different people coming together without working titles. That means you don't tell people that, oh, you're going to be a deacon or you're going to be an elder or whatever in this church. And Dr. Tong's idea is that after a couple of years, you will be able to see who are called by God, because then they will have lasted a certain distance uh, before then you uh, formalize a structure. So we are at a stage where we are still not uh, formalizing a structure, so to speak, even after three years. But thanks be to God that through the three years, it has been quite clear to me that this is a congregation that is led by God. Uh, this is a congregation that is led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have been a Presbyterian elder for many, many years, and I have not seen anything moving at the the way uh, we have moved uh, and the kind of impact that we have brought about the people around us. So I, I really am thankful for God. And so this morning, I want to take the time to pause a little bit and dwell just one step even further into the whole uh, topic about the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, although we have a touch on it in the last uh, anniversary speech for the 23rd anniversary of the Mother Church, but nonetheless, this is such a big topic that, you know, you can really look into it many, many different ways. And so the last time we look at the church from a big C angle, a, a, a very big angle, and today we want to look at the church from a localized angle. So that's the kind of uh, thinking I want you to gear your mind towards. I have entitled today's sermon, Just a Moment, because we are all experiencing different moments in life. And this is our moment in our lifetime. Uh, just as it was the moment for many different people in the history of mankind, throughout history, different moments occur, and God works in different moments. And so, as Brother Paul has prayed earlier, right, I have always been emphasizing to all of you that you need to seek your purpose in life. You need to seek that moment. What is it that God has called you to do? Because the entire Reformed theology is geared towards the direction that we are people who are not just consumer of faith. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 that we are called even before the world was created. Just that sentence alone is very profound and ought to be life-changing. That whoever you may be, however smart or, 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 or silly or, or foolish you think you may be, however rich or poor you may be, 
you are a person who has been called before the world was even created, according to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. And that is a earth-shaking, a, 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 something that is of significance that is far beyond even your imagination, right? So you've got to focus on that. And then this morning, we want to think about what is it that God is calling us to do? What is, what is it that God is calling you to do in this moment in your life? So let's come to before the Lord and commit the time to Him in prayer. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for calling us at this moment in our life to be here, to be in this congregation, to have the opportunity to listen to your word. And so we want to come before you, humbled by the thought that you have called us before the world was even created. A concept that is so profound that we can hardly grasp a even a little bit of it. But we pray for your mercy, we pray for your help, <coughs> we pray for your strength, and we ask that you be with us and teach us to be humble, that we may open up our hearts to your word, for we know that it will transform us. Have mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight, because you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take the opportunity, first of all, to look back into the past uh, year, especially as to what we have done, um, so that you can get a little bit of bearing as to where we are going from this point onwards. Now, we have completed the study of Galatians in an expository uh, method, uh, slowly, step by step. And again, I tell you, among all of you, I am the one that benefited the most because I get to study the word in depth and grapple with it and struggle with it and then be able to share with you from this pulpit. And now we have started on the expository preaching on the Gospel of Mark. Not only that, we have began to post things up on the YouTube and uh, it's quite interesting because it's reaching to a separate audience altogether. And uh, there was some uh, momentous thing that happened, a uh, big item that happened in the past year. We were actually planning to purchase this present place, right? That was what we thought we ought to do, and we prayerfully considered this until the government suddenly declared a kind of uh, regulation with the use of uh, B1 zoning and uh, property, which is what this place is all about. And so all of a sudden, we have to pause and to regroup because the mother church has to figure out what to do because they too, had, we are talking about two units here, they had like five units over the other side. And so strategically, it's something which is pretty difficult to figure out and pretty confusing. And uh, the mother church was in the midst of applying for charity status and then now they try to figure out so what to do next. But this is not uncommon to our church. I don't know whether you know it, but it, uh, our mother church in Jakarta went through a lot of up and down before they actually finally built the church uh, in Jakarta right now. And uh, Dr. Tong has often shared about how they actually lost millions of dollars uh, in the early attempt, where one of the things that Singaporeans cannot figure out is, uh, Dr. Tong said that they purchased a land, uh, spent money on it, and then like five people turned out with exactly the same land title deed uh, in Jakarta. And so the whole thing went bust. You know, for Singaporeans, it's like, how can that happen? You know, but it's apparently it's a part of life over in Indonesia in some places. So we trust that God has his, his plan uh, and that God is guiding us uh, to different exercises. And we fully trust that God has his plan for us. But the, one of the great things that has happened is that we then were able to start a 10 a.m. service and then decided on a 2.30 p.m. service later. And even here, there were a lot of learning curve. <clears throat> Um, whether it's 2.30, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, whatever. Actually, for the three years of our existence, we spent about two and a half years worshipping at 4 p.m. I don't know whether you know this or not. About two and a half years worshipping at 4 p.m. We we, this 10 a.m. service is only barely over six over months old. Um, I know that because I'm monitoring the number of uh, months we have and trying to figure out the impact of the different services. But so for the longest time of our existence, we were worshipping at, at 4 p.m. We do learn a few key lessons there. One of the key lessons I learned is that worship timing is important. <laughs> if you have a worship timing in an odd time, and 4 p.m. is kind of an odd time, uh, it's going to limit uh, church growth. It's, there's going to be some limitation uh, uh, there and, and but then the other thing I learned also is that we thought that by moving into 10 a.m. nobody will come in the afternoon. We were wrong, because there were a lot of people with kids with uh, uh, 
want to wake up late in the morning or whatever, they, they still uh, insist in coming at 2.30. So much so that for today, originally, I thought that we ought to have a combined worship service. But the last time we did something like that, people keep turning up at 2.30 anyway. Because either they didn't get to hear it, they forget it or whatever it is. And so I didn't want to disappoint people uh, who come at 2.30. So today we will still have a 2.30 p.m. service. So this is some of the lessons that we have learned and we of course continue with our range of Sunday school, baptism, gospel and social outreach activities uh, with more plans to come and I'm very happy this morning for example to look at the girls uh, from the Sunday school singing songs, uh, Chinese songs. Do you understand the Chinese that they're singing? Uh, it's a very popular Chinese song, uh, Shen Shi Ai and we can tihui in, in all kinds of things. We can appreciate God in all kinds of things in the in the ocean, in the in the mountains and all that, you know. So it's a wonderful thing to see. Let's look at some of the things that we have done in the past year in terms of ministry. And of course we continue to do our work in Batam in Linka Island. Uh, we had a, a big scale one that we did uh, in June where people went to build foundations of the church. Uh, the thing that was very uh, I'm very happy with the last time was how the young people come together and put up a play, a puppet show play and a gospel play for the uh, young kids over there. And this actually led me to think a lot deeper about our work in Batam, which I will try to share a little bit later on. So we will continue to see some of the extension of the work we, we have in Batam. Um, and like... From here comes here the next phase of, of involvement is with an orphanage, uh, the Viran orphanage in Batam. But the going is very very slow because again they have land title deed uh, issue. You know, so God is training us to think about issues relating to patients and how things work over there. But I, I think that we will continue to look at this area and later on I will try to explain a little bit about where I believe God is. Uh, where I'm sensing the, leader, the, the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit towards our ministry in Batam. And locally, we continue to do different things, for example, working with abuse maids. And here you have our brother David Tanadi helping the maids and all that, doing uh, paper flowers and, and all that to help them to have some uh, sense of financial uh, generation of, of, of income. And, and there are some... Uh, abilities to make this even bigger with a flower and gift kind of a social enterprise that I am uh, actually going to start soon. So this is another thing that is happening with us. And of course, the house cleaning project uh, that we continue to do. This is uh, uh, Michael Sanjaya Kang and Patricia and another person cleaning up the houses of um, Madam Pang, which is really crawling with bed bugs. She's 92 years old. So these are some of the things that we do. And we also went to a, a guy's uh, Mr. Xiao's house. And he is a diabetic patient and is very sick. So we went to clean up his house also as part of what we do. And we will continue to do this. And as I preached last week, right, if you remember last week's preaching, how when we put our five fish, fish uh, five loaves and two fishes in the hands of Jesus Christ, it will become a uh, what? Multiplier. Uh, kind of situation for many people to come. And, and I will testify to you that this is the case for all the work that we have done. Now, because I, I stand in a vantage position, because I am the guy who oversees everything, so I get to see the impact of the work that you guys have done on the ground. For example, the house cleaning project. I think I shared this with you before. The house that we clean, the most horrible, horrifying house uh, that uh, I think Brother Paul was involved with as well, and also Priscilla and all these people, that most horrifying, the one with the crazy wife and the old guy lying on the bed, is now an MCYS case study um, case. You know, it's quite interesting to me that it has become a case study and people are being trained to look at uh, social issue, the use of volunteers coming in together and how to solve issues relating to that. And so I see with my own eyes how God has used the humble effort of this congregation to impact people. Now, a case study means that the whole gang of people will gather together, you know, and I participated in, in the first one. So you have people, head of agencies of important departments of the government, NGOs, all that coming in together and looking at the picture 
A lot of them must have seen Paul's face by now because his face is one of the picture. And you study that and you break into group and you discuss how to improve the society. And that's just one example, all right? So with the Linka Island project, for example, now we are looking at Viran orphanage. So we do see God guiding us and leading us in a multiplier kind of an impact. And I tell you, that is the, the way I have uh, experienced life all my life. And that is, if you are willing to put the five loaves and two fish in the hands of Jesus, then you will see it multiplying. And it's paradoxical. When you are not willing to, when you keep to yourself and you say, I'm going to do my own thing, uh, even in for a church, that you say, okay, I'm going to, to, to do Bible study, I'm going to study, study, study till no end within my four walls, then nothing will happen. You know, it is like I'm going to shine at you and you're going to shine at me. We shine at each other and the light retains within the building and it's not going to make a difference. And so that's one of the key driving factors that I have uh, uh, been trying to drive at within this church itself. So right now, let us look at the idea of the church, right? What, what do you actually mean? Because we are a church, we are a congregation. The Church of Jesus Christ, of course, is made up of all true believers around the world for all generations. And when I use the word the Church of Jesus Christ, you're talking about a capital C here, the Church of Jesus Christ. And so in our responsive reading, we read this every week, and this is one of the things that Dr. Stephen Tong asked me to, to do when we started the congregation, because he said it's so important to be reminded of the key tenets of our faith every single week. One of the sentences says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal. So I believe in the universal Church of Jesus Christ. And so the big C, the Church of Jesus Christ, is a church that includes everybody, everywhere around the world, throughout all generations, from the time of Adam all the way till now. The true believers, the people who are truly in the kingdom of God, belongs to the Church of Jesus Christ, big C. And so I tell you this morning that it includes the people from the charismatic church. It even, in my opinion, includes some people from the Roman Catholic Church. So it's an invisible, big C, Church of Jesus Christ. And if you are a true believer, a true person that belongs to God, then you too, of course, belong to the big C, uh, Church of Jesus Christ. It can be in China, it can be in Indonesia, you know, Africa, wherever it is. This whole big group of people. At the same time, we also use the word church with a small c. And the church with a small c is made up of local believers here and now. And so when we say the church, you can talk about it as a universal church of Jesus Christ, which is invisible, profound, always, always victorious. Remember, always victorious to the very end. And at the same time, you can talk about the local church, which is a small c church. And so we want to ask ourselves this morning, what should this local church be like? The big church of Jesus Christ we are familiar with. We know that it will always triumph. It belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the moment of time, we belong to a small C church. And in this case, it's the Reformed Evangelical Church in Singapore English Service. And so what sort of attitude should we have towards this small C church? And what should we expect from the church, the small C church? and really from ourselves. Now, if we review what we, I, I talked about in the previous sermon uh, preached during the 23rd anniversary of our church, I was talking about the Big C Church back then. And I took First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 12, the famous verse, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Peter said that all of you are like living stones. You are a living stone and, and, and you are put together to build the big church, the big C church. And the other verse is, you are chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who call you out of darkness into his most wonderful light. And so the whole sermon the last time was on the idea that, first of all, you are a living stone and God has deliberately willed to act through you, through the church, the big church. So in the entire history of mankind, God's will is done through his people, the 
in a big C church. And so in this big C church, it can be from the physical church. It can also be from the homeless guy in the street who happened to be a Christian and a servant of God. Right? From time to time, you read about this. Somehow some guy from somewhere would have great act of courage or act of mercy or compassion and, and they will give a lot of money away or they will help someone and, and all that. You hear things like that. So it's not necessarily from our organization. The most recent case is a Taiwanese vegetable seller. Uh, apparently she was on the CNN Heroes of the World or whatever it is because uh, they, they calculated you know, she spent her entire life selling vegetable, making 10 cents, 20 cents and all that. But she have given close to a million bucks of her entire life to, to help the poor quietly until somebody discover her. And so God works through people and that's the way he has meant it and especially through his church, all his people all around the world. And it is very paradoxical for believers in the last sermon that it, it, it is a tough thing to do because the Bible also says that the believer is also the stumbling block for some people. So that was one of the lessons then. And the thing that is most unusual, as I've said from the beginning, is the concept that you are set aside. You're not just anybody living life on earth, drifting around and then trying your best to live life and then finally you just die. It's not so simple. Peter, Paul, all the apostles in the Bible put it very clearly that you are royal priesthood, people called apart, chosen by God, set aside by God, Again, I tell you, before the creation of the world. Okay, so today's sermon, you cannot remember anything, okay? Just remember this one thing, that if you are a true believer, the Bible says you are called by God before the world was even created. Just go and think about it, okay? I tell you, if you seriously think about it, at night you can't sleep, then you blame me for it, you know? Because it's such a big, big thing, okay? So you're set aside a privilege beyond all privileges. And... Set aside for what? You are set aside really for a life of goodness and joy in the Lord. Not a life of depression or a life of misery. Doesn't mean that a life without challenge, but a life ultimately of goodness and joy. Now the young people earlier prayed the Lord's Prayer and the, the order of worship today had somewhat as the opening call to worship. Somewhat. 20, don't look at the paper. <laughs> Someone, 23. I tell you, these two things are the thing that you should memorize. You should memorize the Lord's Prayer. You should memorize Psalm 23. Of course, you should memorize a lot more things, lah, but I must lower my standard a bit. Huh? So if you memorize Psalm 23, the Lord's Prayer, you will find that they are very, very wonderful, uplifting biblical messages to you. Psalm 23 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and my cup overflow, right? So last week's sermon, five fish and two loaves. How many baskets left over? Twelve baskets, overflow. So these are the kind of concept you need to really understand from the teachings of the Bible. Not, not something that I, 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 I invent just to make you happy. It's all from the Word of God. And so that was the key teaching with the big C of Jesus Christ. And so today we want to look at the small C, the small church. The big C of Jesus Christ is made up of all believers. Small C made up of local believers here and now. So as I was saying, what should this church be? What sort of attitude should we have? What should we expect from the church and from ourselves relating to this particular local ministry? And the small C... Church of Jesus Christ, of course, looking at us then, has a lot of distinctiveness from small C church to small C church. Every single small C church is different, right? So when we analyze our congregation, this is to some extent a mixed congregation. Uh, when I was studying in Austin, Texas, I was in Hyde Park Baptist Church, and that's where I met Patricia. So... Uh, well, that's another story. <laughs> so, High Park Baptist Church is a migrant church because it is a church made up a lot of, of many residents, people who migrated to Austin, Texas. So, they were Taiwanese, they were Hong Kong people, 
Uh, at that time, very few from mainland China because that was in the 80s and China was not really open yet. So Hong Kong, Malaysian, Singaporean. So there were some local people who stayed there. But most of the bulk of the congregation are made up of students, people who come and go. And the pastor was the late Reverend Caleb Tang, and I mentioned his name before. And one of the things he said back then, I couldn't quite understand. So he was once talking about how the, the difficulties of his ministry. And he said that the difficulties of my ministry is that people come and go. And after spending three, four years nurturing someone and mentoring someone, the fellow disappear because he either go to another state or he go to somewhere else or he go back home. You know, and I was one of the people who, of course, finally did come back here. And he said that it is a challenge for him. And it's something which I didn't quite appreciate until now because part of this congregation is like that, right? Uh, some of you are travelers. After a while, you will go somewhere else. Uh, some of you will stay here, some will not. And, and that's the case. So there have been some people who already left for studies. Some folks went back to another country. They look for another job and, 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 and move around. And so this is one of the distinctiveness of this church. And so how do we then try to find some reference point as to how a small C church should look like or how it should behave? And to do that, we look into the Bible today from Acts chapter 2, 42 to 20, uh, 47. So there's a typo, 47, entitled The Fellowship of the Believers. And so the, the passage is quite simple. It is a description of how a group of believers gather together uh, and uh, uh, how they live their life together. But there are some important things that you need to know as to why I chose this passage. First of all, this text describes the earliest days of the church in Jerusalem. Earliest days. After Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, the early church was described in Acts chapter 2 from 42 to 47. So it's a historical description of how the earliest, the first, very first church was like. And this happened right after the Apostle Peter preached to the masses of people and about 3,000 people believed and the Bible said they were baptized. And that's the passage before Acts 2.42, right? So this is the context. So there was a lot of excitement. The apostles were doing signs and wonders and people believed in large scale. So you can use the word revival to explain that. And so what happened after that? A church is formed. Not only that, this was a time that happened when early believers were being persecuted and still oppressed. Because later on in the book of Acts, you read about how Paul began to go. At that time, he was called Saul. He went and oppressed and he stoned Stephen, or he didn't stone him to death, but he was the one who approved of his death and persecuted the Christian, grabbed them, threw them into jail. Uh, and of course, a lot of persecution came. So this is the background context of what happened to those early believers. Let us look at what they, they did here. So Acts 42 verse, <laughs> I'm bugged by the fact that he keeps saying 27, 42 to 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So earliest church, they gathered together, and what did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. So the first thing that happened is that we see that the earliest church was a church that had a life that is dynamic and active. It's a, it's a, a live church. It's a church that is dynamic. And what, what is it about? It's built upon the words and deeds of the apostles. So they devote themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They were in awe by the many works that the apostles could do. Now, I want to clarify that signs and wonders, in our opinion, is conducted largely in the early church to establish the early church. Because as I said, they were oppressed, they were being persecuted, and people were lost, they don't know what to do. And so the apostles were given great signs and wonders. Doesn't mean that miracles don't happen anymore, but our understanding is that because the established words and deeds of the apostles are now in the Bible, the New Testament. We now focus a lot more on the Bible, the revealed word of God. So that was the case. 
the church that was dynamic and active built upon the words and the deeds of the apostles. And for us, the apostles' words are now in the New Testament. Not only that, the Bible follows on by to say that all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. This is called communal living, where everybody would live together and you see love in total action via the sharing of all things. We always like to use the phrase, you put your money where your mouth is. You say, oh, okay, I love you. But, you know, don't just say, put the money where your mouth is. Do something to show that's the case. Sometimes when, when boyfriends and girlfriends get together, that's, that's what the girl will say. You know, you, you love me. Is it you really love me? Then you do this, you do that. You buy me that one carat diamond ring, okay? Make sure that the, the 4C is covered, not those cheap natural diamond type, which I would buy. But, you know, buy me the 4C one. You put your money where your mouth is, then I will believe you. So that's the case over there. And I tell you this morning that all my life I have been very impressed by this verse. All my life. Because I think it's most wonderful, isn't it? Communal living. You come together, you live together, you share everything. Now, I know that a lot of us are troubled by many things in life. And you're troubled by relationship, you're troubled by health issue, you're troubled by wealth issue, finance, and finance is one big deal, isn't it? Every time I do marital counseling, I tell the couples that one of the key things that people fight about will be finance. Husband and wife fight about finance. This is a very common thing. It's the, one of those things. So the Chinese say, Ping chong fu chi, bai si ai. That means if you are a very poor husband and wife, then... Everything is so gone, lah, you know, everything is so uh, difficult. And it's, it's a tough, tough thing. And of course, as a man, as a, a father of my own household, it's something which I have to struggle with as well. There were times when you look at your bank account, you say, maybe they made a mistake, you should have a more, more zeros inside on the other side, you know. But my zero is all on the left-hand side. You, you need some math to figure this out. So you, <laughs> you want a lot of zero on the other side, not on this side, right? But mine all over this side. Then you, you panic, right? You start to worry, what's going to happen to this? You know, and, and I, I even had a panic attack one time, one time when I was an entrepreneur. Because the bank has no money, I had to pay people. It was Chinese New Year. I was driving down uh, CTE on the highway and I suddenly couldn't breathe, you know. I thought I had a heart attack. I cannot breathe. No. <laughs> I have to drive the car to the side of the road. And then, God, I cannot die now. <laughs> These people got Chinese New Year coming up. <laughs> I got to pay them, you know. And I went to, to, to see the doctor and the doctor said, what happened? I said, my business partner, la, he couldn't promise me money and all that, but he never make the money. So uh, now I got to face all these people, I got to pay them, and then Chinese New Year coming, you know. Then how, and all that kind of thing. Then the doctor said, ah, panic attack. Is it true? No? How? And then I went back to read about it, and he was right. And so it's a tough situation. Ah, but if you share everything together, isn't that most wonderful? You don't have to buy insurance, right? I mean, why you buy insurance when you share everything together? Anything happen to me, you will help me, what? you know, you will take care of my family and all that. Uh, there was once in a Sunday school, I was invited to teach a class and I asked the people, you know, if something would happen to you, do you have confidence that the church will take care of your widow and your orphan. I mean, a figure of speech. Of course, if something can happen to the woman too, right? I say, if something would happen to you, do you have confidence, full confidence, that my church will take care of my widow and my orphans? And I ask the people that. And I pass around pieces of paper and say, you don't have to write your name, okay? Tell me honest truth. Before God, uh, don't lie. Uh. Tell me the honest truth. Guess what? Most people think yes or no. What do you think? <laughs> e of small faith. <laughs> you are right. Most people say no. I have no confidence that the church will take care of my widow and my orphan. So I better go and buy insurance. La. I better work very hard. La. I better go and uh, store a lot of money in my bank just in case. Because all these people are not trustworthy. <laughs> uh, and I found out that later after I have left, they group together you know, one by one and they make pact among each other. Hey, son, you like a lolly long sea. Ah. Can you please take care of my widow and orphan? Can you imagine that? They actually group together and they make a pact among themselves and say, anything should happen to me, can you please promise to take care of my wife or my children? And I find that fascinating. 
And this verse seems to give that solution, isn't it? That if we were to share everything together and we sell everything together and give to everyone, uh, you would solve a lot of problems. And I mean, it's in the Bible, isn't it? So the question really is that, is this a prescription for the church? Prescription means it's a command. You've got to do it. Is it a prescription for the church? The fact is that we obviously do not practice communion living in our church today, right? We don't. I have told you from this pulpit that if you are in trouble, you get into trouble, you can go to whose house? Whose house? My house, right? You can come to my house, okay? I figure a way to help you out or whatever it is. You know, my house is open to you, right? But can I go to your house? <laughs> That's the next question. Can I, can I, if I'm in trouble, right, if my, 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 somehow my, my, my bank has no money or that, can I go knock on your door and, excuse me, our Bible say that we should live together. Can I, can you, <laughs> I'm servant of God, okay, hello, you know. Uh, then my, by the way, my wife, my, my two daughters and my cat also must come along. And I also have a catfish, I must take care of the catfish. So can we go to your house and stay there? Can, can I? And then you say, okay, la, maybe this guy is the pastor, la, help him a bit, can I? What about other people, you know? Can you do that? Can some guy come and do, do that to you? And it's a very serious question. Now, this is not the first uh, congregation that I get involved in in the startup stage. Uh, when I was very young, I got involved in a fellowship group that became the Agape Presbyterian Church today. Uh, it actually started in my house because my late auntie was a preacher, and so she started a, a, a small little community using my house, my premise. And you know, my late auntie means my mother's sister. So at that time, my mother and my father, they are not Christians yet. So, but you know, they were willing to let my late auntie use the house. And we were very young. And so you get all the children in a community together and it grew and become like a church. And one fine day, you know, these all kids are on the street. They are like gangsters and all that. And I learned a lot of bad things from them, by the way. <laughs> One guy appeared with two baggage knocking on our door and he said that, oh, uncle, my father kicked me out of the house, you know, because I did this and did that kind of thing. Can I stay in your house? You know, and my father was like, what in the world is happening? You know? and, and that's the kind of thing that's happening. But we do not do that, right? So that guy stayed in my house overnight. Then my father said, hey, you better go and find your own place, okay? One night only, you stay overnight, you go. So that's the kind of thing that does not happen too much in, not certainly not in a way in the New Testament because we do not practice communal living in our society today. Are we being asked to do so by Acts 2, 42 to 43? And many people think so because you think about it, it's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. It solves many, many problems. And so many Christian groupings attempted at one time or another, a communal living, or there are some that are actually implementing communal living today. And even non-Christian organizations promote communal living, depending on what. For example, the biggest one is the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hatterites, which are communal living Christians in pockets of the USA, Philadelphia, some part of Canada, where the church believed that we all should live together and we all should share together. And so they all wear the same kind of clothing. They live in a commute without water, running water, without electricity, certainly no iPhone, you know, they just live together. And the thing that impressed me a lot was that if a couple get married in the community, the whole church go and build their house. So it's a very habitat for humanity thing. I love it. Whole church go and build your house. No? So, you know, like, I think our latest couple that got married would be um, Martin and, and Rika. So they got married. They can, can you imagine if they got married? We say, hey, next week, they all, next month, they're going to get married. Let us go and build their house. So the whole gang of us go and build their house. And they all support each other that way. They share everything. So this is a classic case of commute living. There are about 500,000 of them, you know, all spread all over. North America. These are Anabaptist Christian sect that is very conservative and very old in its very, very history. There are other groups apart from them. Unfortunately, they are the cult and the fringe groups today. Communal living was very big in the 60s. Hippie era. You know, uh, 
Beatles and the whole gang of them. And she said, all you need is love. Uh, all you need is love. And then we come together. And all you need is love, love. And then they come together. Love is all you need. You know, just come together and live together. And you share bread and you drink water. Uh, you live commune. And of course, cult groups. So many of the cult groups are marked by the idea that they live in a commune and they share everything, and then there's some kind of mind control. So these are more like religious groups. But the, of course, the biggest of them all that promoted communal living would be the communists and the Marxists. The word communist in Chinese is gong, chan. Gong chan, the meaning means we share possession. So the original idea of the Marxist idea is that we must come together and we have a classless society where everybody is equal. So no matter how you have food, no matter how you share, no matter how everybody gets a fair share or rather a share of everything, don't care whether you, how poor you are, you get food because we will make sure that the rich don't exploit us. So we go and make sure everybody is gong chan. We all have communal, communist kind of idea, and you live together. I mean, it sounds great, right? Everybody come together. But of course, it really, really didn't work. And one of the key reasons is because of this. Communal living assumes that all are created equal and all have willingness to share. That was the earlier concept, that we're all human beings, especially in the Marxist idea, without even the concept of God. The Marxist says, Karl Marx, you know, that why should some people be richer than others? Because we are all human beings made in the image. Uh, he didn't say made in the image and likeness of God, but we are all human beings. So we all should share in the resources of the world. So we are all equal, and at the same time, you therefore must be willing to share. The fact is that you are not created equal. You are not created with equal gifts, with equal abilities. And it's a fact of life. For example, in school, right? You can go to school. Some people in school, all of you know, really uh, people who irritate you like crazy because they don't seem to need to study and they do very well. Do you know people like that? Uh, I was one of them, uh, just to let you know. <laughs> it's like, it's very irritating to see people like that, right? They always have the answer. Teacher, I know. Teacher, I know. Uh, then the teacher, even the teacher get fed up, you know, then she will shut up, don't ask any more questions. It, it's not you, I don't want to call you anymore. What about you, Asing? Asing, what I study like crazy, you cannot. You are not created equal, right? Even among my siblings, four of us, my late sister, three boys. My parents place great emphasis on my sister because first girl. They queue up overnight, okay? CHIJ uh, at St. Nick, at Chimes. Now, that a long time ago, my mother went to queue up overnight just to pull her in because they say, wow, this girl very clever. So, but too bad she's not very clever, you know. So she, I, my, 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 my memory is that she studied very hard, no, she really did. Well, stay on there every day, she studied, studied, study. but cannot make it, uh, CMI, just cannot make it. Very tough. Every time exam got problem, all that kind of thing, she just cannot make it. But she is a good businesswoman. A good businesswoman, but just not good academically. So for the one of the things I remember, she always looked at me and said, how do you do this? Huh? How? Huh? I look at you, I watch TV, I play game, I all that kind of thing. And then what? How come you can score and I can't? We are not created equal. And you know that, right? You put everybody in the starting line, in the race, start to run. Some people just run faster than the others, no matter what you do. You know, you look at the Olympic Games, 100 meter dash. Everybody is of a certain race. You know, they are all mostly African in makeup, right? I mean, you're Chinese, you say, wow, well, I try my best, I sure can. If I believe there can be miracles, if I believe, then I just try, try, try. It's not going to happen, okay? It's just not going to happen because you are not created equal. They are created with uh, larger lungs, I don't know what it is, uh, bigger quads or whatever it is. That's just the way it is. So don't care how hard you try, you're not going to win 100 meter. Olympic Games, it will never happen. Maybe Paralympic Games you can win, but you know, but Olympic Games you are never going to win. So you are not created equal, and it's biblical. The last part of the Ten Commandments says that thou shalt not covet your neighbor's possession. 
I asked Dr. Tong this question about communal living, and the first thing he told me is that the last commandment of the Ten Commandments say you shall not cover your neighbor's possession, meaning that your neighbor can possess things that you don't have, meaning that God is pleased that your neighbor can possess things that you don't have because your neighbor maybe work harder than you, cleverer than you, or whatever it is. And that is the way life is. And of course, the second fact is that we are fallen and we do not naturally willingly share all we have. We don't. So the Marxists think that by making you share with one another, you will. And so they come up with a lot of stories to do that, you know. One of the stories I find very interesting is they have this hero called Lei Feng. I don't know whether he's real or not a real guy. And I read a lot about Lei Feng. Wow, he's like Jesus Christ, okay? Well, in a me he as a soldier, uh, in the middle of the night, he don't sleep, no? He go and look for the socks of his soldier, got a hole, uh, he take it and go and sew. Where got such thing, you know? I don't believe, you know what I mean? <laughs> and China says it's Lei Feng Jing Shen. You're going to follow his style, you know? Do the Lei Feng Jing Shen, do his thing. And, but it doesn't work because today, China is far, 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 far away from the original communist idea. And so to force the issue, to force a communal living, to say that because X do say so, let's all go and sell everything and we come together, I forcefully make you give up everything to each other. This will result in certain failure. Hence the massive failure of communism today. In the entire world today, there are actually only two communist states left. One is North Korea, the other one, Cuba. And, 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 uh, and Cuba is already unraveling. And wait until old men die, the whole thing will pa, turn. Uh, North Korea is still unknown, you know. But only two can happen. And, and that comes about at the cost of a lot of blood. A lot of people die, a lot of people continue to be executed and put into jail. Because if you force it, it will not happen. And so we also, therefore, do not see communal living becoming mainstream Christian practice today because of all these various issues. Therefore, Acts 2, 42 to 47 is descriptive, not prescriptive. Descriptive means it describes what happened to the early church, but it's not a prescription for the rest of Christianity. And large part of the Bible not large, but some part of the Bible is descriptive in nature. So you need to understand the difference. You don't just go and look at the Bible and say, oh, it's in the Bible, so you must do it. No. Some of it are descriptive in nature. It describes what this is all about and what happened back then. doesn't mean that it is a prescription for us. And so what's the solution then? When communism fails, what has happened is that the world found its champion in capitalism which is always there anyway, but now it's a swing towards capitalism. And the solution of the world about all these things is based on self-interest. And this is a famous saying by Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of the Nation, father of capitalism, many, many years ago. Adam Smith said that when you go to the market and a fishmonger sell you a fish, the butcher sell you his char siu, or some vegetable lady sell you the vegetable, uh, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we expect our, expect our dinner. Benevolence means goodwill. Your butcher, your fishmonger, your baker did not bake the cake for you, a nice cake coming right here, did not bake the cake for you because of the kindness of their heart. No. Adam Smith said it is from the regard to their own interest. And so the word says greed is good. If you're going to work at your self-interest, everybody take care of yourself, then the world will prosper. That is the solution of the world. However, God's method is not like that. God's method is based on love, fairness, and willingness, not compulsion. We see that very clearly in the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, verse 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. This is God's method. Not an enforced communal living method, a communal giving method, but a willingness method, a fairness method, a method that come about because of our understanding 
of what God has given to us. And so if you are given much, much talent, much resources, much ability, God will expect more from you. And if you are not given much, when you are born, you have some disabilities, or you are not able to do some things because of whatever circumstances, then less will be asked of you. This is one of the reasons why people like Patong, people like me, work very hard. Because we understand that we have been given much. Not in terms of monetary, but given much in many other things, more so than other people. And so we know that more are demanded from us. And 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the church, small church of Jesus Christ, this church should be a place where people willingly and lovingly share each other's burden. And these burdens are both spiritual and material as well. But it has to be done in a willingly manner and lovingly manner. This explains the way I lead this church. Some of you may have noticed that I do not compel you to do many things. I do not, for example, take attendance. I do not, for example, come and bug you and say, that, Hey, you okay, never come to church for so long. Blah, 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 blah. Some of you, yes, but not all of you. I'm not, I do not, for example, be very legalistic about many things because I understand this principle. I understand that there are tools to be used. So like when we go to Linka Island, when we go and uh, reach out to the ladies making the flowers, when we go and clean out the houses and all that, when we promote Sunday school, cell groups, all that, I understand all this as tools so that you are helped to develop a natural willingness to act out in love and not because you are forced to do it. And so I have very little patience towards people who do ministry with a grouching, unhappy kind of a spirit. So for example, if I ask you to do flower arrangement, you come here and have a happy, so many people might ask me to do it. You know, if I ask you to play the piano, you know, I got exam, you know, I got a lot of things to do, you know, while I just say, Chow, ask me to practice piano, you come here and I guarantee you, I'll tell you, don't do it anymore. You know? My principle is very simple. If you want to grumble, don't do it. If you want to do it, don't grumble. You know, the Bible, grumbling is a very big sin, especially in the ministry of God. You grumble about your life, you know, that's another thing. Lah. <laughs> but in the ministry of God, you do it with an unwilling and unhappy spirit. Maybe for training purposes, I will let you do it, especially for the young people. Very hard to expect them to willingly, lovingly. Yeah? So for them, maybe discipline is important. But ultimately, if, if you're going to do things unwillingly, that's not the principle of the Bible. And so I pray that our church will be one where people come together willingly and lovingly. And finally, the verse says, Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and together with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Two things come across strongly. First of all, there's positive impact on the society because praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, all the people around them. And so when this early church came together, they applied the principles of God Almighty. Yes, they shared everything together in the early stage, but you see that it did not last. But at that period of time, they had so much impact that the favor of all the people were upon them. I believe very strongly in this, and that's why you are being pushed out into the society. Because I want people to look at us and say, Oh, the Reformed Evan Evangelical Church. These are people who care. These are people who make a difference. These are people who change lives of others with a spiritual life, material life. These are people who get rid of big bucks in my house, you know, because you want a positive impact on the society. At the same time, you see that there is indeed a numerical growth of the Church of Jesus Christ. And the Lord added 
to their number daily, those who are being saved. The last one, the actual numerical growth of the Church of Jesus Christ is a stated goal by our senior pastor. And so this is called the Reformed Evangelical Church. Not only about Reformed theology, it's evangelical in nature, and so it continues to go out and reach out to more and more people for Jesus Christ's sake. And so at least from the example of the very first church in the history of mankind, or rather the very first small C church, organized church, because in the Old Testament, the people are also considered a church with a big C. We see, therefore, in summary, that it is a church life that is dynamic and active, built upon the words and deeds of the apostles. And so for the Reformed Evangelical Church Singapore, as we go on, this will continue to be the basis of what we do, that we will build everything upon the words and the deeds of the apostles as seen in the Bible. We are always going to be a sola scriptura church, a church that is built upon his word. You look at our logo, can you see it? It is based on logos, the word of God. So we will continue doing that in the years to come. We will be, in the early church, it was a church with people who lovingly and willingly share each other's burdens in life. And we want to be that church as well. I want you to be excited about coming to church because this is a place where people know your name, where people care for you, where people will share your burdens, both spiritual and material as well. It will take a long time to build to that extent, but this is the vision that I believe God has given to us in this particular church. We want this church to be a church that will bring impact to the society as was the case in the early church. And so we will continue to think about what is the impact we want to bring to the society around us. And I mentioned earlier about the Batam ministry and the work that we have been doing. We are consolidating and moving forward with all these things. Um, I, I, I will continue to engage you in many of the work that I'm already doing so that you are reminded of the great grace and mercy that God has given to you. Uh, even for me, from time to time, I need to go and clean up a bit about infested house to be reminded that there are people made in the image and likeness of God who are in terrible state. And it really will readjust my moral compass, so to speak, you know, that you become a lot more thankful to God and engage with the society. And so uh, we'll continue to do the through of the activities that we, we, have, uh, be, we believe God is calling us to do. At the same time, we want to also grow numerically and dynamically bringing the gospel to the lost. And so I am sensing that perhaps God is bringing us to Batam in a more engaged manner. I, in recent weeks, I've been thinking and praying about this a lot. It's a natural fit. Half of this congregation is Bahasa-speaking people. Uh, the other half of the English-speaking people. I think that there is a Tremendous synergy to go in to Batam and to make a real difference in the lives of the many people there. I noticed that in Indonesia, there are pockets of places which are considered Christian, right? So, oh, this place is a Christian place, that place is a Christian place. Batam is not one of them. Could it be that God is calling us to make Batam a Christian place? Uh, with its proximity to Singapore, we can continue to impact the society over there through the work that we have been doing in the orphanage, in Linka, in maybe other areas. But at the same time, could we not bring the gospel to the lost there, uh, especially with our Bahasa-speaking congregation members? Can we not go there and assist? We actually have a branch church there you know, in, in Batam. Is this some of the things that God is calling us to do? And so I pray that we have sensitivity towards the way God is leading us, that we can speak bring the gospel to a lot more people out there. Doesn't mean that we won't do any gospel outreach in Singapore. We are going to do one in the Christmas uh, candlelight situation as well. But this is something that I pray that I am sent, trying to seek the guidance of God. And so I invite all of you to pray with me as to where God is leading us towards. And so ultimately, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this moment in our life, we are here, there is a purpose. And although these are the general ideas of what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about, and we learn more from it, 
ultimately, my job really, as I've said it over and over again, is to help you to love Jesus Christ above all else. And if you love Jesus above all else, then everything will fall into place because we will be guided by the love of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will love Jesus, you will love life. Because as I preached last week, you have only one life to soon be passed and only work done for Christ will last. Let us pray.